Calling all Portlanders and anyone willing to travel, Murder in the Rain has a live show scheduled for June 24th. Join us for a night of true crime in Portland's beautiful Revolution Hall. Tickets are on sale now at revolutionhall.com or at murderintherain.com. We hope to see you there. Gifting is hard. This isn't news. But what might be news is that you can now send beer, wine, and spirits right to your friends and family with Drizzly, the go-to app for alcohol delivery. Which is good news because adult beverages are the only gift that no one ever returns. And Drizzly's tailored experience lets you find the perfect drink for the occasion, no matter what it is. You'll save time by shopping a huge selection of drinks from wherever you are. You'll save money by comparing prices on said drinks across stores. And you'll get to spend more time sipping with your giftees. You know, if they're the sharing type. Download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com. And get your favorite drinks delivered today. Ding dong, it's Drizzly. Must be 21 plus, not available in all locations. This is Murder in the Rain, where each week Emily Rowney, Alicia Holland, and Josh McCullough tell true crime stories of the Pacific Northwest. Murder in the Rain contains graphic content. Listener discretion is advised. Have you ever heard the term trial by media? For those of you that might find it to be a new phrase, it's been made popular over the past century, and it means that television, newspapers, podcasts, articles, you name the media type, can influence a person's reputation by helping others see them as guilty or innocent before that person has ever gone to trial. It's a thought-provoking concept because despite how hard we try, it does indeed happen. Even after a verdict is read, it's hard to let go of the perception you had of the parties involved. I think many of us still think OJ did it, right? So imagine how hard it is when all of that information is given to you before the trial. How can you not be biased? Today's case is interesting because the concept of trial by media affects not only the accused, but the victim as well. Before the trial happened, there was a very clear line among people on whether or not they did it and why they did it. Now, it's normal when the family sides with someone, but it's intriguing when it becomes an entire town or an entire city. Even more intriguing when there's the possibility that witnesses were tampered with long before the crime was ever committed. I do want to give a warning that today's case references domestic violence, something that, on average, 20 people per minute are affected by in the United States. We probably each have nine or more friends, right? Well, one in four of your female friends experience intimate partner violence in their lifetime, and one in nine of men do too. If you're experiencing domestic violence, there are people who can help. Please call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-7233 or text START to 887-88. Lisa Northen never disputed the fact that she had killed her husband. Truth be told, she informed police that she may have killed him. But the story that she would go on to tell would change, like many of the stories told throughout her life. She was adamant she had to kill her husband. If she hadn't, it would have been her or her son. When Lisa's case was being prepared for court, it by no means drew notoriety across the country. But in the Northwest Corner and in Hawaii, it became known and highly anticipated. People were intrigued and even moved by the fit, pretty young woman who claimed to have desperately fought for her life. And yet, many people stood behind the victim to point the blame at her. Once court was over and the case settled, many were left scratching their heads at the outcome. Soon, one of the most famous true crime writers in the world would discover Lisa's case and pen her final chapter. And what she had to say showed Lisa in an entirely different light. 
Over the next two episodes of Murder in the Rain, I'll share Lisa's story and dig into why, when picked apart, it didn't quite line up with the evidence. So, was Lisa Northen married to a monster who terrorized her every day, or was she the monster? Lisa Ann DeWitt was born to her parents, Wayland and Sharon, in Silver City, New Mexico, on March 10, 1962. A little over a year later, her brother, John Keith, who goes by the name Tor, was born. When they were mere babies, the family relocated to Missouri for a few years before ultimately settling down in the small city of Walla Walla, Washington. Walla Walla is where Lisa met her lifelong bestie, where she thrived in high school cheer, gymnastics, tennis, where she became homecoming queen. It was also when she got to put a label on herself. She changed her given name Lisa, L-I-S-A, to the more quirky spelling, L-I-Y-S-A. Looking at her old high school yearbook pictures, you see a happy girl who has it all. Good looks, friends, popularity, and plenty of extracurriculars to keep her busy. To all around her, she seemed to have a charmed life. She lived in a large home on a cul-de-sac. She had two parents, a doting brother. She went to church camp, and her family was well-known in the area. But as Lisa grew older, she began to open up to those closest to her about how horrific her childhood really was. She described a father who wasn't around much due to how involved he was in his own teaching career. So Lisa was left to suffer at the hands of her abusive mother, at least according to her. She claimed her mother regularly screamed at her and often the fights turned physical when she would be slapped and hit with belts or other household objects. She, on more than one occasion, claimed to have suffered 26 broken bones at the hands of her mother throughout her childhood. She would go into detail about how her mother would have her kneel in the bathtub during the beatings because Lisa would often lose control of her bladder and her mom didn't want to worry about the cleanup. After high school, Lisa made her escape, heading to Oregon State University in 1979. She remained there for about two years before realizing OSU might not be for her. But while she was there, she met a guy she referred to as Ray. Ray was apparently a football player, a good one. The pair fell in love and got engaged. Unfortunately, Ray died in a car accident near the Oregon coast a couple of months before their wedding. Oh. There isn't much known about Ray or their relationship. And interestingly enough, I can't seem to find any record of an OSU player dying in a car crash from 1979 to 1981. Interesting. Lisa did get married in the summer of 1981 when she was just 19 years old. Her first husband, I don't have a name, was a musician. Once they married, they relocated to the East Coast so he could attend Cornell University. Later, Lisa would reflect on this marriage as somewhat of a sham. She would tell people that she realized right away she shouldn't have married him and that the marriage only lasted a week, or to the other person who she told, two weeks. In reality, she had been married to him until 1985. Upon her request, they moved from New York to Hawaii, something she had really wanted. As their marriage ended, her husband came to the realization that she lied, like, a lot. She would disappear for hours on end. Lisa told him that she had started experiencing blackouts on occasion, where parts of her memory were just gone. She believed this might have something to do with the seizures she had as a child. That was news to him. She told him that when she was younger, she was prescribed Ritalin or Dilantrin to maintain it. Two very different drugs, by the way. Due to her proclivity for lying, as seen by him, he dismissed her claims of blackouts as just another crazy Lisa story. What is, what is it, Dilatrin? Dilatrin? What is that? Dilatrin. Okay, so we know Ritalin is used for, like, ADHD, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like a calming effect. Dilatrin is what I believe they give to epilepsy patients oh. to help with seizures. Ah, gotcha. So maybe she was just confused and that was the one she was prescribed, but she made it sound like it was, like, one for or the, the other. Same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. While still married to her first husband, Lisa had a string of flings. In 1983, she had a brief tryst with a muscular Hawaiian man whom she fell for hard. He broke it off to already being in a relationship, and the pair was able to salvage a long friendship. She would often go to him in times of need and even reflected on their relationship as something very important to her. She briefly dated someone while she was enrolled in the University of Hawaii and was working as a research diver. During that time, she told people, including him, that she had been raped by the man who was captain of the boat they were using. 
Later, she said she was also sexually harassed when she was training to be a Navy SEAL. Later, she clarified that that was a Navy SEAL class, not the entire thing. Apparently, the man who was testing her swimming and diving skills in the class had touched her inappropriately, so she kicked him where the sun don't shine and laughed it off. In the summer of 1985, Lisa struck up a relationship with a recent University of Hawaii mathematics graduate. He was just her type, tall, fit, and attractive. She came off to him as adventurous, good-looking, fun, and different from the other girls he normally dated. She told him she had a bachelor's degree in journalism and that, humble brag, she was a genius IQ. The pair grew close quickly, and soon he introduced her to his family. Everyone liked her. She was charming and sweet, and she seemed to like them, too. She loved their neighborhood and really seemed to enjoy being there in their home with them. After being together for roughly a year, they had planned to go on a trip. So as they drove to the airport, a bizarre scenario unfolded. Lisa began to cry inconsolably. After a while, she was clutching her bag and stared out blankly in almost a catatonic state. She didn't seem to know who her boyfriend was or what they were doing or where they were going. He ended up taking her back home and realized she couldn't remember the past three years. She kept talking about some Hawaiian man that she believed she was dating. To her, it was still 1983. Hmm. Not shockingly, their relationship ended, but the amnesia didn't. For months, this went on, and his family even allowed her to stay in their home for a few months while she sorted through her issues. Eventually, the entire family started to wonder if it was all a charade. Already suspicious of her story, it all blew up when after she moved out, a family member found one of her old journals. Lisa was an avid journalist. She filled up dozens upon dozens of notebooks throughout her life. This one, found partially buried under their cabin, detailed the outline of a story, perhaps a novel. It depicted a fake amnesia plot to get out of a relationship. <laughs> she bar- not only left a journal behind at someone else's home who she was scamming or conning or whatever, and then buried it? So was this her life imitating her art? Or did she try out her own amnesia plot to see if it was believable so she could write a screenplay? We don't know. The ex-BF, whose family kindly took her in in her time of need, eventually found out the truth, that she had been married the entire time (gasps) they were together. What year was this? 1985, like late 1985. Okay. I I think amnesia people could still kind of get away with. Yeah, sure. (laughs) That was very hot in the 80s. Oh, so many. Very (laughs) very soap opera. Yes. She had told him, like others, that she had been married a bit over a week and that the only reason she married him was because her parents found out she had had premarital sex with him and demanded her to marry. That story was untrue. Lisa was still, in fact, legally married for several more years. Her husband was still living in Hawaii in 1985, but they were living such separate lives, and he didn't know what to believe about the story she told him, and eventually he threw up his hands and decided to leave her and Hawaii. He moved to California in 1986 and eventually filed for divorce in 1987. That's very different from the short-lived, week-long marriage she described to many people throughout her life. I mean, I know you say, like, manifest what you want, but I don't know if you can, like, retroactively (laughs) do do that. I do love how 80s it is, too, because you can't Google anybody. You can't look up anyone's background. No. Who knows how many married people were carrying on multiple families. About a year later, Lisa met a new man. Like her previous husband, he was tall, slim, fit, and an artist. He wasn't a musician, but he was a photographer and cinematographer. In fact, this is a name some might recognize as he is quite accomplished at his craft. And if you don't recognize the name Donald King, you would recognize his work. He is one of the world's premier guys to do ocean shots. He shot the surf sequence in the James Bond flick Die Another Day. He worked on Castaway, Point Break, shows like Lost and Deadliest Catch. He also did many of the ocean shots in the classic, one of my favorites, Blue Crush. So go check out his IMDb and you will be blown away. I love Blue Crush. Dawn and Lisa met briefly after her amnesia boyfriend. By 1987, the pair was married. 
Lisa told Dawn all about her life, her epilepsy and the temporary amnesia she experienced in recent years, her long divorce with her first husband, which wasn't quite concluded by the time Lisa and Dawn were engaged. Thanks to Dawn, the divorce was finalized. Lisa didn't yet have a career when her and Dawn started things up. She told him her majors had been journalism, marine biology, and now video technology. This guy has done so many movies. It is nuts. insane, right? Yes, yes. I, th- I thought you might like that. <laughs> I, I love it. Uh, what's his name? Don King? Donald. Ronald? Donald wow, King, but he yeah. goes by Don. Endless Summer to Lost to Blue Crush. And my God. I know. Impressive. I could see why she liked him. And the best one on the whole list, City of Angels. <laughs> <laughs> what surf scene is in that? They're on the beach at one point. Oh, I think okay. all the, well, actually from the poster I'm seeing that there's a bunch of angels standing on the beach. Yeah, it's true. Looking up at a just gargantuan Nicolas Cage and Megan, Meg Ryan. <laughs> Megan the, Ryan. Megan Ryan in the sky. Thank you. <laughs> nice. Her own father believed that she had completed a degree in marine biology, but she never actually completed any of the majors she mentioned. She just had a few years of courses. Don took her under his wing and taught her photography. His talent and skills were vast, and apparently he was an excellent teacher to boot, because before long, her photography started to earn its own reputation. Lisa spent much of her time photographing surfers in large waves. Her and her photos were described as fearless. In 1990, Lisa and Don created a book called Honoma Bay, an island treasure. Don shot the photographs and Lisa authored it. Lisa and Don were together for about nine years, and over the course of that time, they purchased multiple properties. Both of them made a very healthy living, but Lisa longed for property. I'm talking about purchasing property like I purchase sunglasses, the only thing I collect. They bought property in Hawaii mostly, but eventually Lisa convinced Don to buy property in Bend, Oregon. Her ultimate dream was to own a ranch slash spa there. Though they made incredibly decent money, they couldn't afford her dream property, which was dozens of acres. So they started out small with a six acre property. In 1991, Lisa became pregnant with her first child. Al-Kai Zayn King was born in November of that year, and he became the center of Lisa's universe. Don traveled a lot for work, often filming for weeks on remote islands around the world, so naturally Lisa spent the majority of her time with Al-Kai. When Don was home with Lisa, all she could talk about was getting more real estate. Eventually, they purchased a house on a quaint little street in Kailua, a small town on the east coast of Oahu. It was an older house, and it required his parents to co-sign, but the street felt like home to her, and it made her happy, which made him happy. The street their home was on was the same street where she was sheltered in a home with her ex-boyfriend's family while (gasps) suffering memory loss. So it really did feel like home. So she, like, sought that out? Yeah. They were neighbors. That's sick. And they lived there. He didn't, but the family did. And they... They didn't like her. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, gross. Dawn was really good with Lisa and very accommodating, but her need for property wore on him over time. She always wanted more, and he was insistent that they didn't have the money. They had to pay off what they already had. He eventually realized her goal was to own hundreds of acres in Oregon to create her spa, and this was not something in his life plan. They began to drift apart and fight, and eventually they moved into separate bedrooms. She blamed him for things he had nothing to do with, like the time they were doing a joint photo shoot and she forgot her camera. She claimed he left it on purpose to dull her shine or make her look bad. She would fantasize about a different life, obsessing with what it would be like if she was with one of her previous boyfriends. She also started convincing herself that she had cervical cancer. She began writing to one of those previous boyfriends and detailed to him how she had cancer and how she was taking morphine and seeing a cancer counselor. It was all untrue. Eventually, after being together for nearly a decade and gathering six properties together, their marriage disintegrated and they decided to seek a divorce. While they were separated and sorting through the details of their divorce, which was complicated with multiple properties, a joint business, book royalties, and a child together, Lisa met her next husband, Chris Northen. In 
In the early morning of October 9th, 2000, Lisa Northen walked through the sliding door of her brother's kitchen in southeast Washington for an unscheduled visit. Tor, who was deep into his morning routine, was surprised. He knew she was in Oregon, but he hadn't expected her, and he hadn't expected her to look the way she looked. She had a bruise on her face and a cut on her hand, and her clothing and hair appeared to be damp. Tor was a doctor, but he was a chiropractor, so he urged her to go to the emergency room at the nearby St. Mary's Medical Center in Walla Walla. Lisa assured him she would get medical treatment, but she felt more comfortable getting it from someone she knew. She planned to see one of her close friends nearby who happened to be married to a doctor. This wasn't the first time that Tor had seen Lisa sporting bruises, left by, according to her, her husband Chris. He tried to intervene in the past and told her on several occasions that he wanted to confront him, but she would repeatedly ask him not to. As they exchanged words in Tor's kitchen, Lisa casually expressed that she had fired a gunshot at her husband, to which her brother inquired, did you hit him? But she said she wasn't sure and then quickly exited, saying she needed to pick up her son at her friend's house. Tor called after her to give him a call to let him know how she was doing. Lisa then traveled nearly 40 minutes to Dayton, Washington, where again she surprised her friend by showing up early to their house. Her friend lived on a farm and had Lisa's eldest son, Alki, for the weekend. Lisa had planned a camping trip with her husband, Chris, in northeast Oregon and left Alki with her friend so that the pair could create art together, something her son really enjoyed. The camping location was hours away, just outside of Wallawa, Oregon, so it was pretty startling to see Lisa show up hours early without so much as a call. Her friend took in the sight of Lisa and was concerned. Lisa was first and foremost sopping wet, so wet that when they hugged, her own clothes came away wet. She was freezing and had a swollen red cheek, bruising around her eye, and she was carrying her arm oddly like it was out of socket or maybe broken. She asked why she was there, but Lisa didn't answer and instead said the baby was still in the car and she needed help getting him out. Then she exclaimed that her husband had tried to kill her. Lisa had a backpack slung over one shoulder and she dropped it into the corner of the room as she said this. Her friend, incredibly startled by the words, followed her outside to get the baby out of the car. They then went back inside and Lisa took a hot bath, put on some of her friend's clothes, and drove herself to the hospital for medical care. The nurses at the hospital took initial notes for the physician's assistant and wrote that Lisa had a bit of bruising around her eye and a few scratches on her knee and shoulder. Lisa explained to the nurses as they looked her over that she had been the victim in a domestic dispute, and that's why she came in. She went on to tell them that she had been camping with her husband and they got into a fight. He had been drinking and taking pills, and when she suggested that he needed to stop, he tried to hold her underwater in the river, and the only reason he stopped was because their young son came out of the tent. She waited for him to fall asleep so she could leave with her son, and eventually he did, so she tried to sneak around him, but he attacked her again. Later, she ran by a sleeping bag, which was outside of the tent across the path, and fired a shot at him. One of the nurses asked, why did you drive so far? It's nearly four hours from the campsite to Dayton. And Lisa simply said she wanted to get treatment first. Columbia County police were notified Lisa was at the medical center and that she had been in a domestic dispute with a firearm. And they decided to wait outside, ready to take her statement. Deputy Kevin Larkin eventually sat down with her and learned from Lisa that her husband was addicted to drugs and booze, and he had been beating her regularly for a long time. She said he tested himself for drugs all the time because he was a pilot and he needed to know when his tests might be dirty so he could call in sick. She explained that the pair drove separately to the campsite for the weekend. She drove up to Dayton from Bend to drop off her son at her friend's and then drove back down to the campsite to meet him. And that's roughly eight hours of driving. During the day, she left the baby with her husband and took a solo hike. And then she came back and things were fine until the evening. Chris was already drinking from a red cup so she couldn't see the contents. She said he had a knife and all of a sudden was being threatening with it around their son, waving it around and even holding it to his throat at one point. She claimed to slap the knife out of his hand and then took the baby for a car ride for about 20 minutes and then came back to make dinner. After they ate their dinner, 
She suggested to Chris that he was drinking too much vodka and that if he kept it up, he could lose his children. He then got angry and threw her while sitting in her chair into the river. She got out and then got her baby and went into the tent while Chris slept in his sleeping bag outside the tent again, laying across the trail. She believed he did this to stop her from getting to the car. She said she then tried to walk by him when she thought he was asleep, but he attacked her. Eventually, she said she got to the car without him noticing and used a hidden key he didn't know about to get a gun from the car that she had hidden in her camera bag. She loaded the gun. Later, she found Chris sprawled out naked on the sand next to the river. She opted to help him in his drunken stupor get back into his sleeping bag. She then told him she was taking the baby and leaving. She claimed at that point she blindly fired a shot at Chris to scare him, hoping that he would not follow her. She was not aiming, just firing into the dark night, which she described as pitch black. She then grabbed the baby, put him in the car seat, and drove straight to her brother's house hours away. I should note here that Lisa took over an hour telling the deputy the story, so they were already aware that there was some sort of gunshot, but she took an entire hour before she got to the part of the story where she actually fired the gun. And at this point, she's saying she didn't know if she hit him or not. So he could be out there bleeding to death, right? Right. For all she knows. she's taking her sweet time. Taking her sweet time. When asked where she got the gun, she said that it was her father's and he had given it to her to defend herself because her family knew her husband was abusive. Her injuries were documented with photos, and then she took the deputy out to the vehicle where she showed him the gun, a Taurus model 85 38 caliber five-shot revolver, and she had that stored in a Ziploc in the front seat. He could see that two shots had been fired, not just one. Mm. So when he asked her, she explained that one accidentally went off when she was loading it back into the car. Lisa was asked to remain at her friend's house while the officers obtained additional information from authorities in Wallawa County. However, when Deputy Larkin arrived at that friend's house, Lisa wasn't there. She had gone off with her brother to meet a family friend who worked in law enforcement in Umatilla County, where she again told the story to everyone, reiterating that Chris was doing drugs and drinking heavily during their camping trip. While she was away from her friend's home, It gave the deputy time to talk to the friend who informed him that she had been trying to convince Lisa to leave her husband for years and that it was his idea to go camping, not Lisa's, because it was kind of an odd time of the year to Mm. go camping. But what she didn't do was hand over Lisa's backpack to the deputy. She neglected to even mention that Lisa had left any belongings there. So that's important to, to note that. Meanwhile, that afternoon in Wallawa County, Sheriff Ron Jett received calls from officers in both Columbia County and Umatilla County, suggesting that he go check out the campground near the Eagle Cap Wilderness Trailhead. Apparently, a woman had detailed a story to officers that something terrible occurred at the campsite. Sheriff Jett sent his undersheriff, Rick Stein, to check it out. The campground was the one closest to the trailhead and was positioned next to the Lowstein River in northeastern Oregon. Wallawa County is booming with people in the summer months. It's a gorgeous area with mountains, lush forests, and rivers. I myself spent a few summer camping trips at Wallawa Lake, reveling in how easily the deer would just walk into your cabin like they own the place. It's just a really great location. But in October, it's a little bit different. Now, don't get me wrong. It's still a recommended month to go outdoor camping, but it's definitely quite a bit cooler. It's much less populated. So if you are into that type of thing, it's kind of a perfect time to go. There's campsites everywhere. When Under Sheriff Stein headed into the campground, it was very quiet. There didn't seem to be anyone there. He had been asked to take a look at the campground near the trailhead and along the river to see if anyone there needed help. As he approached, he could see a single car parked near the campsite, a white Chevy Suburban. He got out of his vehicle and called out, and no one responded. So he walked down towards the river, and that's when he saw a bit of blue fabric on the ground. As he approached, he realized it was a mummy-style sleeping bag, and it was occupied. At the top of the bag, he could see a bit of blonde hair poking out. He spoke to them again, now right next to them, but there was still no response. 
He had a sinking feeling, knowing he wasn't going to like what he was about to see. He gently reached his hand into the sleeping bag and under the person's chin to find that they were ice cold and there was no pulse. There was also a dark, sticky liquid on their hair and on the sleeping bag, which appeared to be blood. In that neck of the woods, you don't get a phone signal, so Stein had to get back into his car and drive about a mile south until he could get reception. That's when he called for more cops and a medical examiner. As they were sent to the site due to a woman named Lisa Northen claiming that she shot at her husband Christopher at the campsite, they had a strong suspicion they had just found Christopher Northen. But it didn't take long to officially ID the man in the sleeping bag. Though there were no car keys and no cell phone around, his wallet had been among his personal belongings. And inside, they found his Oregon driver's license, his Hawaii driver's license, and an FAA pilot's license. Christopher Northen had been shot and killed by his own wife. By dinner time on October 9th, Lisa was placed under arrest while the investigation was underway. This was totally unexpected to her. Why would she go to jail? Her husband had been trying to kill her and had threatened to kill her for years. She was totally unaware that anyone would see this as anything other than self-defense from her husband who clearly had terrorized her nearly every day of their marriage. Christopher James Northen was born on September 12, 1956, to his parents Dick and Jean of Oakland, California. Two years later, they added Mary to the family, and a year after that, their third child, Sally. The family was close. They did everything together. They went on family vacations that they all participated in adventures on, like hiking, climbing mountains, and riding horses. They ended up relocating to Bend when the kids were in grade school, and eventually they bought a huge ranch. After graduating with a master's, Dick taught junior high, and his wife Jean raised the kids and took care of their new farm. Chris was always funny, attractive, adventurous, and very, very blonde. He had big plans after he graduated high school in 1974, and no, it wasn't getting a few degrees at college like his dad. It was to have fun and travel. He wanted to scuba dive and mountain bike and do any adventure outdoors. He ended up moving to Monterey, California and picking up odd jobs whenever he could get them. He worked to live. He ended up moving back to Bend when he finally decided it was time to consider what to do with the rest of his life. He took classes at Central Oregon Community College, learned to play multiple instruments, and after a couple of years, he decided he wanted to become a pilot. By 1980, he earned his student pilot's license. By 1981, he got his commercial flying license, and he even started teaching other people how to fly. In 1983, he officially had his first real job as a pilot. He spent the next few years flying charter planes all over the world. Chris started taking jobs that would allow him to see the world, living in exotic places like the South Pacific Islands and New Zealand. This was what he wanted for his life, but it was hard on relationships. He had several girlfriends over the years, but due to his schedule, it made it hard to settle down and get serious, as most people want to do in their late 20s and early 30s. Eventually, Chris graduated with his Hawaiian Air Pilot's license with several other people whom he remained close with for the duration of his life. He had a dream situation, a job flying from Hawaii to the States so he could have the best of both worlds, the tropics he loved, which offered him adventures in the warm waters, and Bend, where he could adventure in the snow and see his family he loved so dearly. Throughout his 30s, Chris enjoyed life flying for Hawaiian Air and living in both Bend and Hawaii. The other pilots were his friends, his roommates, and life was basically one big bachelor party until he met Lisa King. Chris had been sharing an apartment in Kailua and would regularly see a beautiful, slender woman walking along the beach with her little boy. It turned out she was his neighbor. The pair struck up a friendship, and eventually it became more. Soon, they were in love. Initially, most of the people in Chris's life liked Lisa a lot. They looked like a perfect couple. She made her own money. She gushed over him, and he gushed over her, and the sex was perfect. She talked about it all the time. In 1995, early into their relationship, while Lisa was still married to Don, the couple became pregnant. 
Friends said that the baby was a girl and they already had a name picked out, but unfortunately there were complications in the last few months of the pregnancy and she had to have a procedure. No one really knows for sure if the baby died in utero and she had to deliver it, or maybe it was even born alive and put up for adoption, but most believe that the baby did die and she had to deliver it. Do they believe she was pregnant? Yes, they all saw her. There are pictures. Okay. After the pregnancy, the pair split for a very short period of time, which is common. And so most of them thought they would go their separate ways. But instead, they found themselves back together and Chris seemed even more dedicated to her than he was before. He began living with Lisa in the home she had once shared with Don. Lisa always made it very clear that she wanted to marry Chris. She just had to get, you know, divorced. To the people in Chris's life, it seemed obvious that Lisa was the pursuer. She seduced him. She never held back on her feelings for him. She would write him these beautiful letters to show him her love and her passion. She even detailed what their life would be like together as they grew old. He was under her spell, and eventually, the guy they described as a forever bachelor was on the same page as his future bride. He wanted to marry her, too. And he helped her wrap up her ongoing divorce by early 1996. She was free to get married again. Lisa was certain the life that she wanted was with Chris. They had similar desires to spend their time split between Bend and Oahu. They both loved adventure and they had the means. After all, Lisa was making up to $12,000 a month on her own. And he was a successful pilot. Maybe now she could have the life she always dreamed of, a spa in Oregon. A month after she was legally allowed to marry, they got hitched on the beach with one of Chris's best friends officiating the wedding. The wedding was, of course, romantic, but not overly so. After all, it was pretty hasty, and the pair had to work out a prenuptial agreement ahead of time. They agreed to keep their own financial assets should things go badly. There wouldn't be any division of property unless they bought that property together. They agreed there would never be alimony payments paid between either of them, and Lisa dictated that she would be the one to have full custody of all their children, any future children. Oh, and lastly, they each had to buy a million-dollar life insurance policy. (laughs) Now, in our realm, prenups aren't usually a thing, but this is actually pretty straightforward for people with means. I guess it was described as a very normal prenuptial agreement. Unlike that football player? Did you hear about that? No. Some Th- guy. Shoot who, the shit. Some guy who's this, you know, I know nothing about. Shoot the poop. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know nothing about football, like football, soccer. <laughs> um. Anyway, I guess. Oh, a, yeah. A I super saw that. famous guy. All of his stuff was in his mom's Yeah. Name. His, his wife is like, I'm divorcing you. I've had it. And I'm coming for half your stuff. And he's like, OK. And once they got to court, they were like, oh, he's put literally everything in his mom's yeah. name. And he has to ask for money. <laughs> it, he put, I think it said 80 percent of every yeah. asset he has is Pretty in his smart. mom's name. I know it is. That is very smart. <laughs> but that also would have been nice to like tell them ahead of time rather than like. Yeah, it's obviously not a healthy relationship to yeah. begin with. But I think that's smart in general for all those young athletes that make all that kind of money. Mm-hmm. Give unless, it to your family. Unless your mom is well, not trustworthy. Yeah, true. <laughs> or put it in some sort of like third party trust. Yeah. Then. Anyway. By late 1996, the pair was pregnant again, but soon there were signs that everything was not perfect for the couple. Chris's friends started noticing that Lisa seemed to come over less and less. At first, she was highly interested in his life and his friends, but before long, it seemed like she was actively avoiding them. Lisa, who was pregnant in 1997, had a new group of friends, women from her birthing class, as well as a group of women from the pool where she would often take her older son swimming. She was a bit of a celebrity in this realm. The popular girl married to a good-looking and accomplished pilot. Lisa was still an avid writer, filling up her journals and even writing screenplays that she hoped to sell one day. She was seemingly doing very well. Dane Northen was born May of 1997. Chris was enthralled with the bundle of joy, never realizing how much you could actually love a child. But with the birth of Dane came a new side of Lisa that Chris wasn't prepared for. She had always been very friendly, the kind of person who gives a wonderful first impression and makes friends wherever she goes. She had a bond with his entire family. But after Dane was born, her mother didn't have plans to come visit. 
So Chris's mother, Jean, did. She thought Lisa could use some help as she had a cesarean and the pair had always gone along well. So she thought it would be a good bonding experience. But boy, was she wrong. Lisa was not interested in having a visitor, which I can relate to. I can understand. That's fair. But Chris wasn't exactly helping with the baby, right? Because he's a pilot. Mm. So you would think maybe she could use an extra set of hands. So the mother-in-law describes that she would like do a load of laundry, cook some food, and then just spend the entire day on the beach away from her because she knew Lisa was not happy about it. Wow. Fun. So again, this was a new side that he was now seeing where she was argumentative and combative, and he was just not prepared for that. Marriage certainly wasn't a piece of cake. They argued more and more, both of them wanting alone time. She was frustrated that he wasn't better with the kids. More and more, she started to complain about the relationship and that there were many, many things about him that she just despised. Her most captive audience for her rants were her pool friends and the mom she met in her birth class. It seems her life wasn't so perfect at all. On December 5, 1997, Lisa called the Honolulu police after an argument with Chris. By the time police responded, Chris wasn't home, but they did write up a report. Now, they had been to the Northens home before. This was their third visit. The two previous visits had both been for break-ins. The first time someone had broken into Lisa's car and stole her credit card and some cash. And the second time someone had stolen her scuba suit from the house. This time, she was claiming that her husband had been screaming at her, but that he didn't hurt her physically. The police took down the information in the event they were ever called back. The police would be called to come to their home again, but not for a domestic disturbance and not in Hawaii. The Northens' home would be burglarized again. Lisa was writing constantly, and more and more it was focused on screenplays. One of her latest dreams was to sell one and make it into a movie, and all of her work was done on one of her computers. And while they were at their bend house, she came flying out of the office and sobbed to Chris that two of her computers and one of her cameras had been stolen. Chris called the police and filed a burglary and theft report. Officers noted that one of the doors appeared to have been pried open, and that's how the thief got away with the loot. Chris called the Gateway Computer Helpline and was able to get the serial numbers for their laptop and desktop so that police could put that in the report in the event that the computers show up at some point. A desktop? Oh, I guess it is back the then. late 90s. Yep. I guess. Mm. Now, the computers never did show up. And unfortunately, Lisa never made backups, so all of her screenplay work disappeared. In 1998, the pair began seeing a counselor together, according to one of their friends. This didn't go well, at least for the pair. It began with Lisa taking an entire session to outline all of Chris's annoying habits, including his anger. She demanded that he change his behavior, and yet she didn't give him any room to discuss his issues with her. Eventually, she refused to continue the sessions, but Chris kept going on his own for over a year. Good for him. Chris's sessions were usually around discussing his conflicts and his marriage, he was dedicated to his marriage and wanted to work it out. He recognized that he had anger issues and that though they took a long time to boil to a head, they would eventually burst out of him. He worked with his therapist on how he could control that anger by avoiding violent arguments and walking away to consider the issue and approach it once the anger had subsided. Like a healthy way to do it. Yeah. But in 1999, the couple's problems were still escalating. While together in Bend, they met up with a couple of friends for some drinks. The evening didn't go well due to the couple's bickering, and it ended up ending early. On the ride home, Chris and Lisa got into an argument, and it got physical. He told his friends that he had accidentally hit her when she was being irrational and pulling at his arm. But to Lisa, it was more of the same. He was abusing her. A few days later, she arrived at an immediate care center in Bend and saw a new doctor because the wound she had gotten on her knees from falling to the ground during their argument got infected. The doctor told Lisa that she had an obligation to call police for situations like this. Lisa pleaded for her not to call, but she ended up doing so. Officers met with Lisa at the clinic. They documented her injuries, but she didn't have any plans to press charges against her husband. 
In the police report, Lisa described that she had embarrassed her husband at dinner and on the way home, they got into an argument about it. He pulled over, forced her out of the car, threw her on the ground, which resulted in her scraped knees and bruising on her thigh. She then went on to say that he had anger issues and he drank too much. Eventually, the police went to the North and home to speak to Chris. He wasn't there, but after hearing that the police were out looking for him, Chris stopped by the station. He was read Miranda rights and moved to the Deschutes County Jail. He ended up getting bailed out the very same day, and police had noted that he actually looked to have more injuries than his wife. She had actually admitted to punching him in the face and injuring his nose, and that obviously looked worse to them than her scraped knees. Not saying it was, but that was what they noted. This was the only arrest that Chris Northen had on file for domestic abuse against his wife. The case against him was actually dropped and a destruction order was filed. So that means they destroyed all of his photos and all of her photos. So they are no longer in existence. So they basically nulled Nulled the whole thing. Okay. Later, when asked about this incident, Lisa said she did get a restraining order against him, but he just came home immediately after being arrested, which that's not how that works. She did say that they were in the police were in cahoots with Chris like he knew them. So that's that's one side of things. Now, the charges were dropped because she never actually filed them, but she claims that's because Chris had threatened to kill her if she did. The destruction order was Chris's way of wiping the incident off of his record. As the 90s came to a close, friends and family started to notice a breakdown in the marriage between Lisa and Chris. She had pulled away from his friends, and now she was pulling away from his family. When Dane was about one year old, Lisa's friends began hearing stories from her about Chris's alcoholism and his violence against her. On one occasion, she had broken down in the showers after swimming with her friends at the pool. She told them that Chris had been hitting her and even kicking her. She then showed them her back, which had a large bruise on it, like uh, described as a goose egg sized. And she lifted her hair and her friends confirmed that they saw a bald patch. And that is where she claimed he had pulled her hair out. They consoled her and suggested that she leave him, but she said she couldn't. And that no matter what she did, he would find her. And they even went as far as to call resources themselves, but were told that there's nothing people can do unless she did it willingly. Eventually, Lisa and Chris spent most of their time apart. When Chris was in Oregon, Lisa would stay in Hawaii and vice versa. Neighbors started to notice that Lisa seemed to be changing. Her once outgoing personality seemed to be dull when they saw her. She often looked like she hadn't showered, going out to run errands with greasy hair and rumpled clothes. When Chris was in Bend, he had been focused on renovating and refreshing their home. A repairman named Don Strain was hired by Chris to help from time to time. One of the jobs he would often do was hole patching. He came to the home on several occasions to patch holes, and he said they appeared to look like they were made by someone punching and kicking at the wall. But he also noted that the holes seemed very, very small, much too small to be made by someone the size of Chris. Now you have quite a bit of the background regarding the Northens. This seemed to be a relationship that grew more toxic every single day. So why did it continue? Why didn't Lisa leave? She had the means, a strong career as a photographer that could support her anywhere she wanted to live. By the end of the relationship, it seemed like she was actively avoiding him, choosing to go to one house when she knew he was at the other. Then why was it so hard to leave? Why was she so scared? The possible violence that Chris and Lisa inflicted on each other came to an abrupt end in the dark hours between October 8th and 9th, 2000, when Lisa shot Chris in the head and killed him. She was arrested and her court date loomed. It was a highly anticipated case with court TV eagerly awaiting their chance to film every minute of it. Lisa had many supporters, people actively posting flyers to tell her story and to accept donations to help her defense. It was signed, quote, thank you for your support of Lisa and your stand against domestic violence. Though Chris was gone and wouldn't get to defend himself in court, He had his supporters too, people who wanted to see Lisa pay for what she did. 
they felt she was cold, calculating, and out for his money. In next week's episode, we'll conclude the case of Lisa and Christopher Northen. You'll learn all about the evidence collected by detectives and all of the bombshells dropped in court and after. We'll pick apart Lisa's story and you can decide who the monster really is. I think this room might be haunted. Something just happened. Oh. Hmm. My script, which was at the top, I did not touch my device. It suddenly fast forwarded to the 23rd page. That sounds about right. The number 23. (sighs) Must be Michael Jordan. Oh. Oh. You get get, uh, three 23s together, you get a 69. Hey, oh. And that's why we're here. (laughs) (laughs) 23 and me. 69 and us. (sighs) Buy three and get a 69 free. (laughs) Don't forget your clicker. Yeah. Oh. I I think I don't have that many. What do I do? (laughs) I literally thought that. I was like, Josh is over there going, I don't have nine friends. (laughs) Nine friends? That's too many friends. (laughs) Um, yeah, that's all. I cool. <laughs> my, mm, don't have much to do. Lisa Northen never disputed the fact that she killed her co- her cousin. <laughs> oh my god, the story keeps changing. <laughs> Just like her. <laughs> While they were still married, nope. While still married to her first husband, husband. <laughs> <laughs> He broke it off due to already being in a relationship, and the pair was able to salvage a lifelong friendship. No, that's a lie. I'm just telling lies, just like her. (laughs) The pair grew close quickly, and soon he introduced her to her family, to his family. (laughs) (laughs) If it was all a charade, should I say charade? No. I feel like charade sounds better. <laughs> no, charade sounds like uh, Michael Scott. Charade's funnier. It's the I mean, UK version. Yeah, do both. No, Who knows? it's okay. Okay. I like charade. <laughs> was it all a charade? I, I love know. a charade. Have either of you known a suspicious a suspicious journaler or a note taker uh, that you think is like... I wish I was one. Yeah. But it was one of the most psychotic experiences of my life. <laughs> I'm not. I was not that type. <laughs> Mine was like, "You're you're ugly. You're stupid." Oh yeah, no, <laughs> bitch across the top, bitch. Disturbing. I signed my own yearbook in seventh grade. Oh, <gasps> like because no one else would. No, everyone else did, oh, and I okay. just did it too. <laughs> oh my god, I was just gonna say Matt found one of I think my freshman yearbook, and I was like it'll be okay, and I signed my own yearbook. And he was like, this is the saddest thing I've ever seen. (laughs) Yeah, that is. I'm like, well, lifelong depression, baby. I don't even know, honestly, why I I bought yearbooks, because I seriously, (laughs) all all you get is a picture that I already own. (laughs) And then the rest of the book. It's called memories, Well, I like looking at other people, and like, especially before a reunion, it'd be nice to like remember what they looked like and then laugh at them. (laughs) We'll do our own Romeo and Michelle. Yeah. I'll show up in a limo or a, a helicopter. helicopter with my little sneakers on. Massive plastic surgery. This is this is gonna be a great night. I hope your baby looks like a monkey. You can <laughs> Lisa spent much of her time photo I wanna say it photograph I wanna mm-hmm. say, Photog- you know, photographing, but I wanna say photographing. <laughs> like the photographing. Photographing. Okay. Make it your own. Yeah, say it. As if anyone will let that alone in the reviews. <laughs> What's her name? Or we'll in this back. room, really. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Tilda Jean. Tilda Jean. Oh, Tilda. Also, that's what kind of boyfriend you need. You need a movie boyfriend who does cool stuff, but he's gone for like three All months. Oh, yeah. An underwater photographer who's in Hawaii <laughs> well, a lot. Yeah. Just wait. Mm. Oh. oh. You and Donald? He's a, he's a grand zaddy, for sure. He tried to intervene in the past and told her on several... Nope. He tried to intervene in the past and told her several, on several occasions. <laughs> <laughs> Dramatic effect. Yeah. In a domestic dispute. Dispute. Cool. Yep. 
is pretty close to footsteps. <laughs> <laughs> she had waited for him to fall asleep. She, oh my God, it's show. It's not, it's so, it's not show. Oh my God, was that not halfway? <laughs> oh no, no, no. Hardest thing ever to do is read this sentence. <laughs> Lisa, who is pregnant. What? Marriage certainly isn't a piece of case. Case? <laughs> oh, or cake. <laughs> Let me just change what I said. No, that's good. <laughs> Everyone knows what you mean. That's a classic <laughs> saying. I say it all the time. Fuck you. <laughs> Let's mark that one for permanent deletion. <laughs> Send it to the incinerator, please. <laughs> Murder in the Rain is a Cascade Media production, written and hosted by Emily Rowney, Alicia Holland, and Josh McCullough, edited by Josh McCullough. You can always contact us at murderintherain at gmail.com or through our website, murderintherain.com. If you just can't get enough of Murder in the Rain, for as little as $5 a month, you'll have exclusive access to bonus episodes at patreon.com. You can find us on all of the socials, and for more true crime, follow at M underscore Murder in the Rain on TikTok, and you can also listen to Alicia and Josh on their other show, Always Be My Sisters. And suck my balls. <laughs> <laughs>